Well, folks, at 7.30, welcome to our May meeting at the Ottawa Centre at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. My name is Dave Chisholm, and I will be your meeting chair for this evening. We've got a, a busy meeting planned for tonight. And um, welcome to all those from the other RESC centres from across Canada, and welcome those who are visiting for the first time. Let's move on to the next slide then, please. So a couple of things. Uh, we are in Zoom webinar mode, which is fairly secure, but there are some things that you need to be aware of. Um, first of all, there is a chat box in the bottom of your screen. Um, I will not be monitoring that during the meeting. You're welcome to chat to other people. Uh, please use the question and answer box for questions, and I will raise those with the speakers. Uh, you don't need to raise your hand. Uh, I won't be looking at that as well. But for your security, do not click on any web links that might appear in the chat or the question and answer windows. Sometimes people come in and they put uh, bad links in there. So please uh, do not do that. So let's move on to the next slide then, please. So tonight's program, a uh, quick introduction by myself. Um, Al's, Dr. Al Scott is gonna do our 10 minute astronomy news. I'll be doing the Ottawa skies for May. We have Simon doing the surface of Venus. And we got Pierre de Raymond doing the uh, Quantrid meteor shower. We have a lot of observations tonight, and then we'll have some quick announcements at the end. There will be a five minute bio break in the middle of the meeting, and there'll be a, our uh, monthly M&M challenge. Um, and we'll uh, see how well you know your images. Okay, so let's move on then. So welcome, we've got uh, a bunch of new members here. So we've got uh, Graham Cree, Richard Hum, uh, Calvin Klatt, John Madden and Emily Shearer. So welcome to the RASC Ottawa Centre. And we have 20 new members as well in uh, 2020. So members in the news. So unfortunately we've lost one of our uh, members uh, way back in 1962. He's the founder of the Ottawa Centre Meteor Team and he was part of Melbourne's Army which was a group that was uh, looking at meteor showers and uh, meteors became the focus of the young Ottawa Centre Observers Group back in the early 60s and so uh, we remember Joe Defoe at this point in time. In terms of uh, members in the news, um, Shout out to Attila who uh, shared his outreach stories in the, in the current issue of uh, Sky News. And I'm gonna turn the next one over to Mike. Hi everyone, uh, Mike Mogan, I'm here. I hope you're doing well and staying healthy. Um, I think many of you know that uh, Dave Chisholm, our meeting chair, is also very active in, in, in outreach. Um, he's, he's uh, last year I mentioned that I think at the tail end of the year, he, he had, um, done outreach, astronomy outreach to over 20 groups, uh, scouts, cubs, uh, seniors, uh, seniors uh, groups, uh, church groups, and so forth. And we actually recognized them in the Ottawa Center with the service award for that. Well, I'm pleased to announce that um, Scouts Canada has recognized them with the service uh, uh, accommodation. And this is from what I'm hearing from uh, some friends who are involved with Scouts, uh, that this is, a, this is a big deal. So recently, uh, as, as, as you know, Davis, um, D Davis has had a full schedule of, uh, of outreach activities. And with the, the onset of the, uh, the COVID virus, uh, Dave didn't stop. He kept going. So let me uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So um, what Dave did is that as the COVID virus uh, came into uh, and sort of uh, uh, overtook us, uh, Dave didn't stop with his um, his outreach activities. What he did is he shifted to, to offering virtual sessions through Zoom and, and, and so on. And really, that's what caught the attention of Scouts Canada. Um, you can see here that Dave is uh, he's got a full schedule. He's he's uh, and he's got a lot uh, uh, a lot a lot ahead of him, and, and no doubt uh, many more. Um, just wanted to say that um, I, I actually asked Dave, you know, what what uh, what inspired him to do all this and. And part of it is obviously his love of astronomy and his uh, passion, uh, passion uh, for sharing. But also he was a scout, um, a, a, a cub and scout uh, back in Kingston. 
and his father was uh, it was a, a radio astronomer with, with Queen's University. So he he's had it he's had it uh, in his blood and in his, in his, in his DNA. Dave, um, on behalf of so many people, some people who will probably uh, or maybe too young to thank you, but I'm sure one day we'll be thinking about you. Um, thank you. You, you. you really contribute a lot and, uh, and you, uh, you make us uh, all better. Thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks Mike. So for, uh, for those of you who, uh, who uh, might have a cub or guide group that, that would like a virtual interactive introduction to astronomy, um, they, they, I have two programs that I've developed, and you can just email me, meeting share at ottawa.rasc.ca, and uh, I'd be happy to set up a session for you. Um, I can probably, um, May is starting to fill up. I probably have two or three more slots in May, and uh, right now June is wide open, but uh, it will fill up quickly. Okay, thank you. Al, it's over to you. Thank you, Dave and welcome everybody. Uh, so I hope this is working well. Um, I'd like to go to the first slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, some interesting interstellar interlopers that uh, have come through the solar system recently. So far, astronomers have uh, identified two uh, interstellar comet slash asteroid objects that have gone through our solar system recently. <clears throat> One you may remember is, is uh, termed 1i Oumuamua, and the other is 2i Borisov. Um, Borisov passed perihelion in December and is still being monitored by the Hubble Space Telescope right now. This is an artist's impression of, of Borisov itself. New ultraviolet and millimeter wave observations show that vaporization of an abundance of primordial carbon monoxide is what made this comet come alive in the inner solar system. Now, carbon monoxide freezes at temperatures below 25 Kelvin. So what this suggests is that Comet Borisov formed in the frosty outer fringes of its parent star's planetary disk. And they can tell these are interstellar by their trajectories. They can plot the trajectories and the speeds of these things, and they're looking like they're moving on hyperbolic orbits, which aren't orbits at all. They basically pass by and then leave the sun's gravitational pull. Hubble observations of ultraviolet fluorescence from carbon monoxide molecules in the coma of Borisov showed nearly constant carbon monoxide vaporization over the, inner, over the period as it's traversing the inner solar system. But emissions from water molecules, which are much more typical in the, uh, uh, typically seen in the coma of comets, dropped rapidly. Astronomers realized that outgassing had removed the outer one to six meters of surface material during their observations, exposing deeper layers, which are rich in CO, carbon, which is carbon monoxide. The measurements showed that the amount of CO compared to water was higher than had been, been observed in any solar system comets inside two and a half astronomical units from the sun. Typically, what happens is that the CO, which is very volatile because it vaporizes around 25 Kelvin, as it gets closer to the sun, all the CO leaves and you're left mainly with water ice. Well, that's kind of not what happened here. The water ice went away and all we were left with was CO, which is interesting. So this suggests that this comet formed far out in its parent system where it was very cold and where it actually condensed out of carbon monoxide. A lot of the, the material in this condensed out of carbon monoxide. And that makes sense because something that's far, formed far out in the Oort cloud of, a, of, its, of its own star is more likely to be captured and disrupted and perhaps go interstellar. Now, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, an artist's impression of Oumuamua. It was like nothing astronomers had seen before. If you recall, there was a, a lot of uh, interest in what this was. It was elongated and tumbling erratically. It was very porous, um, low density, moving oddly, releasing only wisps of gas as it passed through the solar system, uh, even evoking thoughts of a derelict alien space, spacecraft. Now uh, astronomers have found a natural model that may create objects like this. The explanation starts during planetary formation when a large object deflects the orbit of a kilometer scale rubble pile type of comet or asteroid, which is held loosely together by gravity. Next slide, please. The rubble pile passes within a few hundred thousand kilometers of the central star, 
Strong gravitational effects from the close passage stretch the rubble pile until it disrupts in the same way as you may remember Comet uh, Jupiter pulled apart Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. In this model, the disrupted pieces speed past the star forming elongated clumps. The star's heat vaporizes the most volatile ices, but those with higher melting points such as water tend to refreeze on the way out, forming a crust that holds the remaining pieces together in porous structures. Momentum would then carry the loose structures outward where a fraction of them could escape that solar system to roam the galaxy. These structures would be left tumbling oddly through space like Oumuamua was doing when it passed through our solar system. So very interesting. This is the first uh, believable explanation I could, I've could i seen for how such a, a weirdly elongated object might form. Next slide, please. Now, I don't know if you can get the, the video on this, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, merging black holes. So the brand new field of gravitational wave observations has continued to advance in the third observing run of LIGO and Virgo uh, gravitational observatories which ran from April 1st, 2019 to March 27th, 2020, flagging new detections approximately once a week while continually improving equipment sensitivity. One of the ways the astronomers improve the sensitivity of these observatories is using squeezed photon states to double their sensitivity. And this is using quantum mechanics in the optical interferometer or Michelson interferometer that detects these gravitational waves from uh, orbiting black holes. Now, quantum mechanical squeezing exploits the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, which tells us that when we measure one quantity of a, of a system very accurately, we can lose accuracy on another aspect of that system. The, the two measurements are linked. So if we know, say, the momentum of a photon very accurately or an electron very accurately, then we don't know its position very accurately. Or if we measure its position, we don't know its momentum. In this case, squeezing has accomplished the use of a special nonlinear optical crystal, which allows astronomers to trade off lower phase variations in the photons in the interferometer against higher amplitude variations. This helps because Michelson interferometers are very precise measurements of phase of light. On the 12th of April, 2019, astronomers were able to detect the unmistakable gravitational wave hum of a higher harmonic and you can see on the bottom of the screen here is the signal of these two black holes uh, orbiting that was, was measured. This higher harmonic was like the overtone that you might hear in a musical instrument. So far, the black hole mergers that we've seen have been roughly equal mass. Well, this one is a highly unequal mass. Uh, and the overtones in the gravitational wave signature become much louder in these type of interactions than in previous mergers between similar sized black holes. So the masses of this particular signal were 8 and 30 times the mass of our sun, respectively. This big mass difference means that astronomers can more precisely measure several properties of the system because they have this extra information of the overtones. They can more accurately measure the distance, the angle of the orbits on the sky, and how fast the heavy black hole spins around its axis. So black holes, you would think, cannot spin because they don't have any surface. But we can tell that they are spinning because they stretch space-time in a particular way due to relativity. And from this, we know that they actually have a spin property which, which, which back kind of twists the fabric of space-time around them. And we can detect it in this signal. So analyses reveal that this merger happened at a distance of 1.9 to 2.9 billion light years from Earth. Two of the 56 discoveries from Observing Run 3 have now been analyzed and published. Stay tuned for more. Thank you for your attention. You're on mute, Dave. There we go. Works better if I unmute myself. <laughs> okay, thanks, Al, for your uh, your 10 minute astronomy news there. So let's take a look at the uh, the Ottawa skies for uh, May 2020. It's hard to believe it's May already. Okay, so next slide, please. Whoops. There we go. Okay, so May 1st, this is uh, what we're going to see in terms of the moon. We're going to have a full supermoon on May the 7th. Uh, this full moon was known by the early Native American tribes as the full flower moon because it was the time of the year when spring flowers appeared in abundance. This moon has also been known as the full corn planting moon and the milk moon. And it is also the last of the four supermoons for 2020. 
Next slide. So we still have up there Comet Panstars. Uh, it'll be visible in the evening skies. Its perihelion, which is the point closest to the sun, is on May the 8th, at which point it should be magnitude 8. Next slide. We have new comet Swan, which is presently 8th magnitude. It's uh, compact and brightening steadily as it plows across the southern hemisphere, and it will soon swing northward. Its first appearance in Aquarius, for mostly for folks in the southern states, uh, by early May. So it's moving north. Next one is Comet Atlas. Comet Atlas is a circumpolar object, visible all night long from the mid-northern latitudes. Expect the comet to slowly fade as it travels from Cassiopeia through Ursa Minor, uh, passing 6.5 degrees above Polaris on the night of May the 1st, that's tonight, and onward towards the Big Dipper. Closest approach to Earth at 1.1 astronomical units occurs on May the 3rd. Next one. The Eta Aquids meteor shower is above average meteor shower. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, about 60 meters per hour. We can see it up in the Northern Hemisphere as well, about 30 meters per hour. It's produced by dust particles left behind by Comet Haley. Um, it runs annually from April 19th to May 28th, peaks on the night of May 6th and the 7th, and perfect timing with our full moon. So it uh, may be a little bit challenging to see this year. Next slide, please. Sun. Is, uh, these are the sunrise and set times. Uh, as you can see, uh, days are getting longer and longer. Next slide. So Mercury is not visible until June 4th, and because our next meeting occurs after June 4th, I thought I'd mention it now, that the greatest eastern elongation on, is on June 4th, and we look for the planet in the western sky just after sunset. Greatest eastern elongation means it's furthest away from the sun, from our perspective, and as uh, the sun sets, you will be able to observe Mercury. Next slide, please. Venus is visible in the early evening and uh, throughout the whole month. And Mars is visible just before sunrise. Jupiter is visible again before sunrise. And Saturn is visible before sunrise as well. Uranus is not visible at this point in time. It's, it's rising during the daytime. And Neptune is visible uh, just before sunrise. And this is our cartoon of the month. So enjoy that. So just give me a second here as I scroll through my slides. Okay, now we're gonna have, we have the pleasure of uh, Simon, who's gonna be giving us a talk, Venus according to Magellan. So uh, let me just turn you on here, Simon, and we'll make you the focus of our attention. There we go. Oh, hang on, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself there, Simon? So, can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Okay, fine, good. Last time I talked to you, I talked to you about the status of uh, science uh, with respect to Venus in 2020. And then it occurred to me, I wondered how much folks actually knew about what Venus actually looks like. If I were to ask you to describe a rocky or terrestrial planet, I'll bet that you would only have two options. Either you'd describe the Earth, with its continents, oceans, and plate tectonics, or you'd be thinking of Mars with its volcanoes, impact craters, giant valleys, and sediments. Or just maybe you skip all that and tell me that Mercury and the Moon are similar looking impact scarred bodies. But I don't think you would be telling me about the surface of Venus. Can I have the next slide, please, Chris? Take a look at this global map of the surface of Venus. I think you'll agree that it's really not very obvious just what you're looking at. So here's a rhetorical question. Do you think you could describe this map? So tonight's real question is, what does the surface of Venus look like? Now what I want to do tonight is to show you some of the major features and components of Venus's surface that you might not be too familiar with, such that at least the main outlines of this map will be a little less unknown to you. Let me be clear, uh, tonight I'm not going to try to explain or question the fundamentals of the theories and hypotheses about how such, such features form. There are lots of them. I just want to familiarize you with their existence 
with an emphasis on how different Venus is as a rocky planet. However, before we get to that, we have to understand something about how we're able to even look at the surface of Venus at all. Venus is surrounded by a thick, opaque cloud of CO2. So the only way that we can see the surface in any detail is by using radar. And looking with radar is very different from looking with in white light. Basically, radar uses a very narrow frequency band that is emitted from a source and then relies on the nature of the reflections of that signal back from the target surface. Now, white light reaching our eyes conveys a lot of information, including and especially colors and shadows. The radar signals bounce back to us depending on three things the reflectivity of the surface, the angle of the surface with respect to the signal that we sent out in the first place, and then the texture, in other words, the roughness or smoothness of that surface. For example, the bright white patches in this image, which are very obvious, they do indeed represent high ground, but the white is neither white rock nor snow. It turns out that the highest ground on Venus is coated with something that's highly reflective for radar signals that formed only at high altitudes where temperature and the atmospheric pressure are lower than at lower altitudes. And this substance is possibly iron sulfide, in other words, pyrite or fool's gold, although there are now several other possible candidates. Have the next slide, please, Chris. So here's a simple example of what I mean. In this image, you can see there are two types of lava flows. You can see a scale bar there to give you an idea of the size. And these two types really are radar light and radar dark. Radar dark is not a color. Here it means that the surface is smooth. The way that the radar signal is being scattered back to us, it, it actually is not much scattering and so it's not very bright. Conversely, radar light here means that the surface is rough, at least rougher than radar dark, which is why the light is being, the radar, is being scattered back to us. However, we have zero direct information here on the color or the composition of these two types of lava. Maybe there are two types, it's just two different roughnesses. Next slide, please. Now, in my last talk, I told you about NASA's Magellan probe, which sent back information in 1990 through 1994. That was actually the last data set for the surface. And I showed you some of its radar images. Well, you can also take radar images of Venus from Earth, in fact, from Arecibo. And the image on the left is from Arecibo, and the image on the, on the right, the long thin strip, is from Magellan. But it's quite clear that the resolution from Earth is pretty limited compared with what Magellan can show us. Next slide, please, Chris. Similarly, compare the Magellan image here, which is on the left, with an earlier radar image of the same cluster of shield vo volcanoes, that's what all those bumps are, those shield volcanoes on Venus, which was snapped by the Soviet Venera probe about a decade earlier, and that's the image on the right. And it's pretty obvious that <laughs> the Magellan image is a much better resolution. Now, in a nutshell, let's go to the next slide, please. In a nutshell, the surface of Venus is made of highlands and lowlands. But the difference in height above and below the average planetary radius is not as extreme as it is between Earth's continents and its ocean floors. Lots of the highlands look like what I call alligator skin texture. That's what you'll see on the left there. While large parts of the lowlands are characterized by smooth plains cut up into polygons of all shapes and sizes. In fact, you can see that on the right. And if you look up at the top right corner of that right hand image, you'll see three round volcanoes there too. So next slide, please. So let's jump back to the global radar map here and try to describe it in very general terms. Let's start by outlining where the high ground occurs. Some of it's already apparent to you from the highly reflective coating on the highest altitudes, but not all of it. And I can, I can annotate this. Um, there is all kinds of highland areas, like here, for example, which are not bright white, and so they're much more difficult to see. And now I have to remember, ah, yes, there we go. I can clear that up. Apparently, oh, I can. 
and there we go. We'll get this right. There we go. Okay, um, can we hit the, uh, the forward button please, Chris? There we go. Now these features have names, some of them you may have heard of. They're mostly the names of, uh, of, of women, classical or famous women, including gods and goddesses. And you'll see in red, there's Ishtar and Aphrodite. Those are large areas. And then the other names in, uh, in, in uh, white and, and yellow are smaller features, which I'll mention. Putting it simply, planetary scientists tend to think of the high ground to the right of this image as being made up of crustal plateaus, which are large blocks of planetary crust that have sort of popped up, while the high ground to the left is made of what we call volcanic rises, which are really large piles of volcanic lava. The principal light gray filaments that you see between Thetis and Artemis down in the lower right corner, those things correspond to networks of very large canyons, which on Venus are called chasmata, that seem to link between these various highlands. Now the principal exception to all this is the circular chasma around Artemis. You can see the word Artemis there to the bottom, uh, bottom right. And just to the, to the uh, left of the word Artemis is a circle. And that circle is a complicated dome-like feature called Artemis. It's over 2,000 kilometers across, and that gives you a sense of the scale for the other features. Some of the highlands, as I say, are isolated from, 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 each, from the others. Those are the ones named in yellow, but some are aggregated together. Ishtar Terra, for example, is the size of Australia, and Aphrodite Terra is the size of Africa. Now, you might be tempted to think of these highlands as similar to Earth's continents. Let me just show you what, Ish, what Aphrodite Terra looks like. If I, can, I, I think I can still do this. Yes, there we go. That would be Aphrodite Terra. And that is about the size of Africa. Now, you might think that they were similar to the continents, but we'd be talking about proto or primitive continents of the very early Earth in that case, not the mature continents as we see them today. Next slide, please, Chris. Hmm. I have to clear my annotation. There we go. So let's have a look at some of these um, highland terrains and see what we can observe in the radar images. Here we are. This is Aphrodite Terra made up of an aggregate of Ovda, that's in the O, Western Ovda with the W, uh, 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 um, a Thetis Plateau, that's with the T, and uh, associated with Artemis, which you can see with the A, and points further east, including Dali, Kazmarov, Canyon, that's with the D. By the way, note the inset up in top right there of uh, the Venus global map with the location of the either by a yellow box or with dots. And those insets will accompany most of the following slides so you won't get lost. Next slide, please. So if we zero in a little, what do we see when we zoom in on Ovda and West Ovda? Ovda is the bright one, West Ovda is the one to the left. Ovda is radar brighter than Western Ovda, which may tell us that Ovda reaches the greater heights. But have a look at the interior of Western Ovda. And we can see there a fine texture developed throughout this crustal plateau. I'll come to this more in a minute. If we look at Ovda itself, which is the bright, the bright plateau, we can see that it has a streaky texture developed all around its edges, but especially at, on its upper right shoulder. And while we're here, notice how both, the, both of the crustal plateaus are surrounded by dark, radar dark, medium to dark gray plains material probably made up of smooth lava flows. There are alternative suggestions, so no one's quite sure. Next one, please. So zooming in even further on Western Ovda, we can now see that internal texture more, 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 more clearly. Let me show you where that is. If you look in there, for example, I think you can see a streakiness, which is in this orientation. And this streakiness is made of, of, in, of close spaced, uniformly distributed lines. They call them lineaments that seem to be distributed radially all over the plateau interior. The question is, what are they? Well, that's the subject of my recent paper in the International Journal Earth Science Reviews, and I'll tell you all about that another day. The key thing to retain here is that West Ovda looks nothing like any surface feature on any other rocky planet. It's simple. 
go to an atlas of the Earth and see if you can find something on Earth with, these, with, with this streaky texture. Meanwhile, notice the radar dark patches. Here's one, that one there. And there are others here and here. They're sort of medium gray color. Uh, they appear to be local extrusions of lava on the, uh, on, on the platform. Also notice how very few impact craters there are compared with Mercury, Mars, and the Moon, either actually on the plateau or surrounding it on that medium to dark gray plane. Next slide, please. And here you can see a detailed image of what those radial lineaments look like when they're seen close up. I won't get into the details of this. Next slide, please. Now, looking at Ogda itself, we can clearly see very similar internal lineaments to what we saw in Western Ogda. Let me show you. If you look in there, for example, you can see them quite clearly. They're oriented this way. And you can see them there as well, and they're similarly oriented that way. And you can see them over here too. And they also happen to be oriented that way. Some are radial to the plateau margins, while others are parallel to the plateau margin. Now, Focus on the margin parallel lineaments <coughs> that you can see at the upper left. Move forward one, please, Chris. And there should be, a, there it is, a little yellow box comes up. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on that yellow box in the next slide, please. And here we see a streaky texture. Uh, note the, the scale bar here. We've obviously zoomed in a lot. Streaky texture with lozenges that appear to represent deformed rocks at the margin of the plateau. The plateau is off the, the bottom of the slide. And they're all cut by these penetratively developed lineaments that are radial to the plateau margin. The radar dark patches, you can see them here quite clearly. Those are more of that smooth material, probably lava, that blankets the deformation features. In other words, it lies on top of them. So they must be relatively late. Next slide, please, please Chris. Finally, this close-up on Thetis, which is the third plateau in, uh, uh, in, <coughs> in this part of the world, uh, um, this shows much the same features, the pervasive internal lineaments, the marginal deformation, and the radar dark lavas. I think you can really see the, the, the internal texture very clearly here. It's not so much linear, it's more like crinkles, if you will. The take-home message here is that these plateaus look nothing like anything we've seen anywhere else in the solar system. And we really don't know what they are or how they form, despite the fact that there are many, many, many hypotheses on the matter. Next one, please. So before we leave Aphrodite Terra, here's a quick peek at Artemis. Now remember I said it's a 2,000 plus a kilometer wide dome with more domes built on top and a huge continuous moat around the outside. It's a huge trough. Remember, note the scale bar there. We really don't know what it is, though some have tried to convince themselves that they can see plate tectonics at work here, but I'm not at all convinced. Next slide, please. So notice here we're jumping to the northern polar area of, uh, of, of, of Venus. This is Ishtar Terra near the Venusian North Pole, and this is a very different kettle of fish from what we've just been looking at. It comprises Fortuna Tessera, a radar bright highland uh, crustal plateau with a pervasive internal texture. That's shown by the F in this image. And then there's Lakshmi Planum, which is a vast, high standing, radar dark, smooth volcanic plain ringed by a rim of even higher ground. And that's the L in this image. And between these two is the brilliant radar white Maxwell Montes, the highest mountains on Venus. It's the only feature on Venus, by the way, that's named after a man. Note the high ground to the west of Lakshmi Planum. It's got internal textures very similar to what we see over in Fortuna Tessera. And I'm talking about this ground here, and I'm talking about these internal textures there. Now, note also that all the components of Ishtar Terra are surrounded by this radar dark smooth lava plain. And note that there are very few impact craters everywhere, whether it's actually on Fortuna Tessera or in the plains. And as you probably know, the density of impact craters gives us a relative idea of age. So this surface of Venus, everything we're looking at, 
is geologically relatively young compared with the age of the solar system. Next slide, please. Zooming in a little more on Fortuna Tessera, we can see that pervasive internal texture. We can see it here, for example. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> and, and that texture actually varies between close spaced margin parallel ridges that I just outlined and that alligator skin texture that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. You can see there and there. And that's made of crisscross crisscrossing lineaments. We really don't know what these ridges are, though most planetary scientists think that they are folds and faults, which were developed at the margins of the crustal plateaus. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. So what about that Lakshmi planum? Well, clearly, it's a high-standing enclosed lava plain. What you can see here are mountainous regions, and on the south side there, rather similar to what was on Fortuna Tessera over this side here. And there are those who think that it might be a massive impact basin, but not an impact basin like on the moon, but an impact basin which would have formed and filled with radar dark smooth lava and then was high standing. That still takes some explanation. Next slide, please. And just for completeness, here's a close up on Telus Tessera just north of Aphrodite Terra, showing the same internal textures and radar dark smooth lavas as the other Venusian plateaus. And next slide, please. The same thing again at Alpha Regio. You really can see the internal textures in the center of this plateau. This really is a typical Venusian feature and we do not understand it. By the way, note that the plateau is surrounded by radar dark smooth volcanic plains and that impact craters are pretty rare, whether it's in the plains or whether it's in the plateau. Next slide, please, Chris. Okay, remember, not all the highlands are crustal plateaus. Some are volcanic rises. Among the most impressive is one called Beta Regio, seen here with the large volcano Theamons to its south. Both of these features are so high that they're coated with this highly radar reflective material. Beta is actually, as you can see in the enlargement on the right, it's cut by a large north-south oriented rift valley with lots of internal faulting and fracturing, suggesting that beta was pushed up into a dome shape that split under tension. And again, look at the scale of this. That rift valley would be easily 75 to 100 kilometers across. Theamons, on the other hand, which is in the, 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 the southern end of both pictures, that shows lots of radially radiating lineaments that are probably fractures that filled with volcanic lava, known as magma, magmatic dikes, a feature typical of Venusian volcanoes and more so than elsewhere. Next slide, please. The other outstanding volcanic rise on Venus, besides Beta, is called Atla Regio. And this image shows radar dark smooth lavas cut by these radar bright lineaments, these really thin lines radiating sort of north northeastwards from a mass of them down in the lower left hand corner of this picture. That's probably a neighboring volcano to the southwest there. But in the main part of the image, you can see these, these volcanoes, individual volcanoes, all kinds of sizes with radiating lava flows spilling out from them. Quite a remarkable image. Next slide, please, Chris. Well, in light of our uh, lightning tour of the Venusian Highlands, let's take a look at the plains. Now, since I already showed you some images of the highlands that also show something of what the simple volcanic plains look like, let's here take a look at what the more complex features of the volcanic plains look like. Next one, please. And some of these features are visually quite dazzling and very different to anything you've seen on any other rocky planet or the moon. The left hand image is what's called a nova. That image is 250 kilometers across to give you an idea of size. What you're looking at here is a radar dark smooth volcanic plain with some east west fractures there in the background. Don't worry about them. That's been gently updomed by some form of volcanic activity that's created radial cracks in the plains material. It's likely that the cracks have been filled with narrow sheets of volcanic magma. So, there again are these magmatic dikes 
it didn't quite reach the surface. And in fact, if one looks at this, this image closely, I, don't, I doubt you'll be able to see this uh, on, on, on small computer screens, that those, those lines that are there are actually narrow rifts that are formed at the surface above the injected magma sheets. On the right is a collection of round concentric features that appear to be linked by radar bright filaments. And again, see that scale bar at the top, that's 250 kilometers. This is a pretty big image and these are pretty big circular features. These spider-like features are known as arachnoids, and the bright filaments are probably, probably magmatic dikes, just, in the, just as in the case of the Nobi. However, the fact that planetary scientists use these strange names, unique to Venus, by the way, really tells us that they're uncertain about what Nobi and arachnoids really are and how exactly they formed. While we're here, Notice that the arachnoids developed in an already polygonized radar dark volcanic plane. If you look in here, for example, down here, you can actually see that the medium dark gray plane there is actually divided up into polygons. We'll come to those a little later. And um, next slide, please, Chris. Here are two more circular elliptical features developed on a radar dark smooth volcanic plane that already had some radar bright uh, uh, lineaments on it. Note the scale bar, 150 kilometers, they're pretty big. These two large elliptical features are what are called coronae, again, a term unique to Venus. I showed you the classical model for their formation during my last presentation. It's a massive upwelling of hot mantle, the rock, rock that rises essentially to the surface of the planet, followed by cooling and collapse of the dome that falls at, forms at the surface and leaving a rimmed dimple. These features occur all over Venus. Next slide, please, Chris. Here's a fine collection of these coronae. This is it right here. Right the way down to there, quite the corridor. And if you look at the scale bar, which is here, you can see that this is thousands of kilometers long. It's forming a chain running across the radar dark smooth volcanic plains. The volcanic plain shows numerous scattered around features, some of which are impact craters, some are isolated corona. Some may be rimmed volcanic plains, similar to Lakshmi Planum up in the Ishtar Terra area. Turn that off. The take home message for this image is that parts of the volcanic plains are simply not simple. As an aside, you may recall that in my last presentation, I told you that a dissenting school of thought suggests that at least some coronae are in fact impact craters. Well, there's no way that this corridor of coronae looks anything like a chain of impact craters. So there's obviously several scores of thought to take uh, account of here. Next slide, please. And just to emphasize that large circular to elliptical features on Venus can be volcanic in origin, here's a beautiful example of a volcanic caldera that blew its top. Surrounded by a radar bright, by radar bright concentric ring dikes, that's these things here, and you can see them there as well. And those are absolutely typical of calderas uh, on Earth and elsewhere. And they form as the volcanic edifice collapses, either under its own weight or due to a drop in magmatic pressure. Notice this tongue here of volcanic material, presumably lava. It's radar dark, smooth lava, escaping to the southwest of the caldera and burying the ring dikes. It's quite amazing that you can actually see this kind of detail, this kind of detailed story through radar images. Next slide, please. So while we're talking about lavas, what do they look like in radar? Well, the large image on the left here shows a variety of radar dark, which means smooth, and radar bright, rough, lava flows. We've no idea of whether they're the same or different composition. The patterns that you see here are influenced by faults and narrow surface rifts oriented north-south that channeled some of the flows. And I mean these things like that, for example. That's a narrow rift that the lava actually flowed down. The pattern of the lava flows in the right-hand image is totally different. And you can see here there are stringy lava flows, which are these things here. And they've piled up behind or to the left of what's technically referred to as a ridge belt. 
And that ridge belt is this thing here. It's actually like a long hill made up of ridges. And again, the strange name means we don't really know how it formed. But these lavas, they broke through a gap right there. Broke through a gap in the hill or the ridge belt, and they flowed out to the right, out to, out to this material here. The, large, the, the really large patch of radar bright material to the right of the, uh, at the ridge belt, um, not sure whether that actually came through the gap or whether that actually piled up from a, a volcano located at the lower right. Next slide, please, Chris. Okay, so we've looked at features that developed in on the radar dark smooth planes, but what about the planes themselves? What do they look like? Well, here are just two examples of radar dark smooth planes and the radar bright networks that cut across them. These are polygons of various shapes and sizes. And if you look at the scale bar on the, 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 the left, that's 300 kilometers. The polygons I'm talking about, they're in here. In fact, they're, they're in all through here. An atypical polygon might be this one right there. So we're talking about something which is easily 50 kilometers across. Um, what are these polygons? Oh, and, 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 and these over here are a different shape, different size, but they're still tens of kilometers uh, across. What are these polygons? Some say that they're thermal cooling cracks. Kind of difficult to believe that given their size. Some suggest that they might be desiccation cracks drying out as sediments dried out when Venusian oceans, yes, I said oceans, I'll come to that in a minute, uh, evaporated. Next slide, please, Chris. Well, I don't know. This feature here, this looks to me like the initi uh, initiation of polygons, but I really don't know what it represents. It looks like a main fracture with side fractures. The bottom line is we simply do not understand these features on Venus principally because they have no exact parallels on any other rocky planet, including the Earth. Next one, please, Chris. So, so far, we've stayed within the conservative realm of crazy looking planetology. So now let's move beyond that to the realm of channels, really long channels that extend for up to 7,000 kilometers in length. Now, these are strange beasts. They don't have any tributaries the way river channels on Earth do. They, they meander, just like uh, a river, uh, rivers on Earth. Uh, you, can, you can see a double meander here on this particular example, and you can see these meanders here, the, the squiggly shapes. That's what the one, one calls squiggly shapes in river courses, they're meanders. Even stranger, the meanders migrate, just like Earth rivers do. They migrate sideways and up and down stream, and they cut off old meanders. That's what this thing, sorry, that's what this thing, sorry, that's what this thing here is. If you remember your geography, that's called an oxbow lake. And in fact, they even show islands in the channels. As you can imagine, there are multiple schools of thought here. Some say the lava, that lavas carved out these channels across the radar dark smooth lava plains, but how does lava remain liquid when flowing over 7,000 kilometers, even on Venus? Of course, Venus is hot today, but we don't know how long it's been hot for. Others say that this is early Venus, when surface water, remember I mentioned oceans, when surface water might have existed on Venus before a greenhouse runaway occurred. But then where are the impact craters that would attest to an old age? We really don't know. We don't have simple answers to these questions. Next slide, please, Chris. So, okay, what's my take home message for Venus tonight? Well, we've done a whistle, whistle stop tour of the surface of Venus, and I haven't explained how anything formed because the reality is we just don't know. There's an abundance of, of, of speculation, but it would take me hours and hours and hours to go through them and even to attempt to try to do them justice. Venus is simply so different to anything we've seen on any other rocky planet. Some, thinks, some, some think it represents what a similar sized early Earth might have looked like before its surface began to evolve over time. That's Earth's surface. 
Others think that the features we observe represent a planet that underwent a unique thermal history due to the loss of all of its water, including that possible potential very early ocean. But remember, we do not know the ages of individual features on the Venusian surface. And we do not know when the current Venusian atmosphere formed or when the greenhouse temperatures were initiated at the Venusian surface. And this presents a serious handicap when trying to envisage the history of geological processes on Venus. Whatever. The bottom line is twofold. Firstly, and of course, this is my opinion, and nothing more than my opinion, we have to go back and remap the surface of Venus using vastly upgraded radar and acquire better resolution images and other data in order to answer any of the questions I've been raising tonight. And secondly, planetary scientists have to be prepared to step outside of the box that they're currently stuck in when thinking about how the geology of Venus works or how it works, which is illustrated by the fact that they have their own unique terminology. New, better data will allow us to go beyond our current limitations, and who knows what exciting discoveries we will make. As always, thanks for listening. Over to you, Dave. Thank you, Simon. Do, does anybody have any questions? If you do, please uh, type them in the question and answer box, and uh, we've got a couple of minutes for Simon to answer those. I'll read them out to you, Simon. Uh, a question for you while we're waiting. Um, so what year were these radar images taken? Oh, th there was a period from 1990 to 1994. Okay. And the, pro the probe was in, in polar orbit, and it did several cycles. It mapped the surface several times. And in fact, if you like, I think there were about six cycles. And so there were early cycle images and later cycle images. It becomes very important to know sometimes if a scientist is showing you images from the early or late cycles, because it has an impact on the quality of what they're showing you. OK, great. Oh, we have a question here. When oh, is the next? I love, I love this question. When is the next robot mission to the surface of Venus? Oh, there will be, a, oh God, let me put it another way, there is a move afoot, a very serious move afoot, to get another uh, robot mission around Venus. They have mentioned the possibility that it could also look at the surface, but the real emphasis is on the atmosphere, and it's very obvious why in big science you can't divorce big science from politics, and politics means money. And the watchword these days in, in, in science and politics is not the surface of Venus, it will be its atmosphere and how it, it, it informs us on climate change. Okay, another question from Gordon. Do you think the smaller radar bright areas are going to be like a lava? Uh, the smaller bright areas, they will certainly be rough. And on, on lavas which are bright compared with lavas that are dark, then yes indeed, those bright lavas may well look like a, -a lava, if one knows what that, that, that is. A, a lava is a blocky lava that you see in Hawaii. A hoi hoi lava is the smooth lava that you see in Hawaii as well. Okay. Are there any other questions, folks? No, that, I think that is it. So thank you very much, Simon. Well, folks, it's time for the uh, five minute bio break. So it's approximately 8.25. So we have a Messier a Moon challenge for you while we have the break. Uh, if you can identify what these are, the answers will occur after the break. We'll uh, restart again at uh, in uh, about five minutes. Okay, so uh, we'll see you folks then.
Okay, you got one minute left to figure out what these images are. Okay, folks, uh, let's get things back underway. So Chris, if you can move on to the answers. There we go. So uh, for our Messier, it's the Sombrero Galaxy. And for the Moon, it's Archimedes. So hopefully some of you folks got that. So moving on. We have uh, Pierre Montin and Raymond Dubois who are going to do their presentation. Pierre, you're going to run your slides, is that correct? Yes, here he goes. Okay, just a quick uh, thumbs up. Uh, you can see my presentation and you can hear me. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Well, good evening. And um, I hope everyone is uh, staying well. So this is going to be a two part presentation uh, that uh, first of all, Raymond and I will be uh, sharing our latest astronomy adventure that we did back in uh, January this year. And uh, then we're going to do a uh, overview about this year's uh, top meteor showers and what to expect and a few interesting facts that I think it will be uh, cool for you to uh, to know. Just going to get uh, okay. So um, a lot of you know me well already, uh, but for those of you who are new or who don't, uh, just a little bit of an intro about me. Um, I've always been very passionate about astronomy and uh, particularly meteors. Even at a very young age, I was really captivated by the, uh, the stuff I was seeing up in the sky. And uh, the first time I saw a bright fireball, I was hooked. I was hooked for, uh, I, I would say easily for the rest of my life. Uh, so even at a young age, I was already taking very uh, meticulous notes of all the observations I was seeing, the uh, meteor showers, the notes, I was tracing the meteors against the, the stars. And uh, here's a bit of uh, what I was doing here. And uh, my very first uh, sort of serious camera that I've used to uh, try to capture meteors uh, here. And uh, even today, uh, here I am with my typical setup. That's uh, most nights, that's uh, the stuff I, I bring. Sometimes I don't necessarily always bring the uh, camera equipment, uh, but my uh, chair, my meteor bag, my small accessories, this is what I use most of the time when I'm going out. And uh, when I get tired of that, I can go to my telescope and also enjoy that. So I take notes, I take voice notes of each and every meteor that I see. And I, uh, sky conditions, the limiting magnitude, I take all these notes together and when I get home, I'll uh, transcribe those into a, um, an online report form that will be submitted to the IMO, the International Meteor Organization. So what they do is they collect the, uh, the data from amateurs around the world and they, uh, it goes into a database that um, can be used for analysis and also by uh, the pros who are researching um, meteor showers and their uh, the dynamics and they can go back and check their, uh, their data or check their um, model forecasting with the actual results that were observed by observers like what I do. So here's a snapshot of the, uh, my IMO profile. So uh, I've been doing this for about 27 years, uh, accumulated over 41,000 meteors and over 1,600 hours of uh, actual observing time. So another uh, site that's uh, relatively new, you might not know about this one, but I find it very, very good. It was uh, created as an online resource for amateurs and professionals where they can share their results very quickly uh, uh, with the world. And it also acts as a, um, 
a replacement of sorts for the now defunct me uh, global meteor email list, which no longer exists. So this is a way where um, anyone can go in and, and log in and actually contribute their observations. And I actually contribute a lot of my, uh, my reports and images on this uh, website as well. And every uh, Monday do a PDF uh, uh, electronic newsletter that can be downloaded and viewed. Let me just do this again, there we go. Uh, so of course my interest in astronomy is not just limited to meteors, but also I, uh, I really enjoy the um, uh, transient sky events like uh, eclipses. So this is uh, my results of the 2017 eclipse. And I actually joined up with uh, Raymond's boss. So uh, he's gonna be tagging along this presentation and also um, talking about his image results for the uh, meteor shower that we saw recently. And over the years, I've been to a lot of different places. So there's uh, just a quick snapshot of um, the, uh, the major travels I did specifically for astronomy, all of which are road trips with the exception of the second one, the 99 Leonids, which I flew over to uh, Spain with uh, 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 people from um, Ottawa and um, California, and we traveled together. And we were able to see the, uh, the major uh, Leonid outbursts at the time. So one of the things that's really enjoyable about traveling uh, for astronomy is that you can also do some of the touristy stuff uh, along the way. So you can really try to take advantage of uh, getting a really a nice experience when you're out there. So now the uh, latest uh, one I'm gonna talk about is the 2020 Quadrantids in a, a road trip uh, to Quebec. So uh, Raymond and I were gonna be sharing our experience, what we did and what made us uh, decide to, to, to go there. So first of all, the Quadrantids, it's considered one of the top three best annual meteor showers. It's, um, it's, it happens right at the beginning of the new year. And this year in particular, it was highly promising. As it was right on new moon, so uh, it meant dark skies, ensuring a good view of the shower. Uh, but also the peak time of the shower was um, highly favorable for Eastern North America, which meant that we really had front row seats to seeing the shower at its best. So, okay, so that's great. Let's plan. Where do we go? What will the weather be like? Is it worth driving very far this time or not? So we decide through a rough idea where we want to go. Uh, but now we have to look at, do we have permission? You know, do, uh, it's middle of winter. So is there going to be too much snow to go out into a field somewhere? Do we want to have maybe a backup site or two in case, you know, we, we can't go somewhere that we, uh, we think we can. So those are all questions we look at, you know, the gear we want to bring, and then which vehicle do we take? And do we have, you know, even the room to bring all the stuff we want, all our cameras and our chairs, batteries and camping gear. So a lot of stuff uh, adds up, especially in the winter time when we, uh, we have a, our big parkas and additional material to keep us uh, warm when we're out in the middle of uh, nowhere. And then uh, when do we leave? So it's always a fine balance between uh, you know, uh, leaving not too far ahead of time so that uh, we have a good idea what the weather is doing, uh, but also having enough time to get to where we want to be and have the time to, uh, to set up and be ready for the, for the big night. So we take a look at all that. And then the, the big, big important crucial step as uh, with everything in astronomy is the weather. You know, the, uh, the weather is, um, if we want to um, be successful with our outing, we really have to take a look at this closely and have a good understanding of the weather the patterns and the, uh, the way the clouds, the wind, the temperature and humidity, fog, all these factors can really affect whether or not we're gonna be successful. So it's, it really helps to have an understanding of what's happening and how to, uh, to predict it. So there's a number of tools, fortunately, at our disposal that we can use, which is very handy. Now here's a new one that I wanted to share with you that I, I really like. It's uh, called windy.com. I, I strongly suggest you use it online. Don't use the app. I was told by Raymond it's not very good. Uh, use the one online and it's, uh, it's very handy. So the, uh, here, I think you, can, you should be able to see my pointer here. Uh, you can, um, if you have this on your phone, you can basically just swipe the date 
and the time. And it'll show you uh, up to uh, several days ahead exactly where the clouds are and where they are moving and where it's clear and where it's cloudy and uh, precipitation. So at a glance, you can really see it very clearly and it's, um, it's super handy for that. Uh, now, the, um, uh, there, there's a function in the menu where you can actually get to the different model forecasts, the, uh, the long range GFS, which is an American uh, model cloud forecast. The ECMWS is the European uh, medium range forecast for clouds. It's, uh, it's actually a very good model and um, gives sort of like an in-between the short range and the long range. And then the NOM model is another American product that gives uh, about a mid-range uh, view uh, up to, I believe, uh, 84 hours ahead in time. So you can actually select between the different models and also get other information such as the, uh, the satellite image, the radar, uh, wind speed, the wind direction, a lot of different things like that you can see in this little uh, site, which is very handy. And of course, you can move the map around and look exactly or zoom in to a specific area you want to see. So another good one is Venture Sky on the right side. Now this one is the uh, same principle. You can swipe around and uh, see what the weather is doing. And lastly, the uh, of course, the um, indispensable clear sky chart which uh, feeds off of the uh, Canadian Meteorological Center for the data. And this is still uh, by far one of the best product to see what's coming up in the next 48 hours in terms of clouds and sky conditions. At a glance, you see exactly where for a site what's, uh, what's happening. So these are all very good products that are indispensable when we're planning for the outing. So after a few hours, like Mo and I were talking about, okay, you know, here's what the weather is doing. It looks like there's going to be a hole uh, up northwest. Uh, okay, well, wait, the south is going to be better. Oh no, wait, northeast. And so we're looking and debating and talking, and and finally we realize about a day before we uh, had to make a decision to travel. Basically, we were near the cutoff. We found that the models were showing consistently from one another a sort of like a channel of uh, clear breaks all along the St. Lawrence River going up towards uh, the northeast. And it looked like that was our best chance within reasonable driving distance. Otherwise, everywhere else it was cloudy. It was heavy clouds everywhere. And it was uh, just no way we would get to like a guaranteed clear skies for many, many hours of drive, which we decided we were not willing to do for this time. So this was our best compromise. We decided, well, let's take a chance. Let's drive up there and try to find a place to set up. So we loaded the vehicle up. Here's all our gear. And off we went. Now we're driving. And along the way, we're looking at where do we go exactly. Like we need to find an observing site that's dark, that's open, accessible, and has, a, has a, um, uh, a reasonably safe area that we won't get bothered by other people driving or car lights or that sort of thing. So we want to find a good spot, which is not that easy, especially in the winter time when there's a lot of snow and a lot of, of the, uh, the uh, astronomy club sites maybe out there are shut down. They don't have a site that's uh, maintained in the winter and that sort of thing. So the... Um, Google Maps is obviously the best friend. Like that's where we can really see, zoom in, and look for good prospects. And of course, a big heavy vehicle with all-wheel drive will help get you to spots where an ordinary car cannot. So there's a site we finally found. We looked at um, a couple of different possibilities, and this one was the uh, the best one, just off the main road in the distance, and coming in this uh, uh, winter unmaintained road, so we knew that the, it would uh, not be an issue because small cars would have probably an issue probably getting stuck in this road. But with uh, Raymond's vehicle, we were able to get in uh, the road here very easily, uh, passing uh, by um, a railroad track that's down here, and a little opening where we found, hey, you know, this is a, a good spot we can set up. It was a little uh, slushy, wet, and icy, so we had to be careful with our footing. But it actually worked out with a wide open view of the sky. And here's our setups. So we had some camera gear, sleeping bags, chairs. So basically, this was our place to be for the night. 
And what did we see? Well, a lot of this. And a lot of our pictures looked like this. For a good part of the night, there was, there was clouds. So it didn't clear for the entire night as we were hoping for, as what the, the, the model forecast were predicting. Uh, but of course, the weather is not yet a perfect science. It does get it wrong a number of times, so it's always a bit of a gamble. But the good news is, eventually the sky did clear up in the late evening. And uh, it gave us a chance, Agamo and I, to take our time to get our equipment set up, uh, check the cameras, check the batteries, check the alignments, and really make sure everything was up and running you know, top notch. Uh, in fact, it didn't really matter if the sky was cloudy early because the quadrantid radiant where the meteors that appeared to come from was still too low. So that part of the sky would not come up at a reasonable elevation until close to midnight. So we had a lot of time to spare, but it did clear. And we started seeing some nice earth grazers, quadranted earth grazers as early as around midnight. And that really kind of surprised me because um, I would expect, you know, I wouldn't have expected to see that many uh, hours ahead of the, uh, the peak, predicted peak time. So that kind of had me worried a little bit that maybe the peak was occurring a little bit earlier than it was forecasted. And I was, we were seeing these long meters tracing uh, paths across the sky, and it was actually very enjoyable. And then what happened is it clouded over, and around one o'clock in the morning, uh, Raymond was taking a, a nap, a short nap, and I was on, I was watching through the, the small holes, the cameras were still taking pictures, and even through the tiny holes in between the clouds, I could barely see you know, two or three stars at, at a time, and I was seeing quadrantids. What, there was one and there was another one and a third one. I was like, whoa, it must be pretty active. And uh, the peak is not supposed to be until about four in the morning. So what's going on? Well, eventually the sky did op open up and clear completely at about three in the morning. And it was clear for a good two hours at that point uh, over a total of uh, three hours with that extra hour earlier in the night. And with a high radiant, uh, the opposite effect was happening from what I was expecting. I would have ex expected the rates to be increasing with the peak time and the high radiant. However, everything was uh, kind of winding down. So the, 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 the activity, hour by hour, went from 26, 28, and 14, as far as the uh, actual numbers that I counted for a total of uh, 71 quadrantids. So obviously the peak did come earlier than forecasted. Now, one of the uh, really cool things that happened during the night was a large quadrantid fireball that both Raymond and I did not see. I was up on my feet. I was uh, doing some camera checkouts, just making sure everything was running. So I did not see it, but the camera, one of my cameras was still working and it actually caught the, the, the fireball and the train that followed, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. So with the quadrantids, it's, um, a lot of you may not have seen it or may have seen quadrantids, but not at, the, at their best. And it's one of the hardest. It's the top three of the year, one of the top three, but also one of the most difficult to catch at their best because the peak is relatively, relatively narrow in duration. If you're not right at the peak time, if you're only two or two, three hours before or after, you're going to see quadrantes, but you're going to see way less than you would at the maximum. So the peak time and obviously the weather, the, uh, the weather tends to be pretty cold at this time of the year, often cloudy. So that means that the quadrantes are just nowhere near as popular as uh, they say the Perseids in August. So there's the IMO, International Meteor Organization uh, summary. Uh, it's the summary of um, hundreds of observations collected into their database and producing the uh, profile of the shower. And it essentially confirms that the peak occurred uh, instead of occurring at the eight or nine UT or nine, uh, four or five in the morning about here, it happened much earlier in the night. And by the time I had the clear sky in this part of the night, I, re I could really feel the, the activity winding down. It was really uh, coming down uh, quite sharply. We still managed to get some really good pictures, even though we weren't quite at the optimal observing time. So this is my uh, meteor composite that I did. 
I took uh, my camera was uh, taking um, short 30 second exposures on and on repeatedly for the entire night until there was over 1000 pictures. And I went through all the images and collected the images with the meteors and they were superimposed on that part of the sky that we see. So all the quadrantids captured over the course of the night that you see are stacked into this uh, image. And here's that big fireball that I captured, that nice uh, bluish uh, uh, turquoise fireball. It was, uh, I wish I would have seen it to the eye because it was really, really uh, something. So this was uh, captured with my Canon 6D and a 24 mil lens, 25 quadrantids. The second camera captured this view for more towards the north. And uh, as you can see, all but one of these meteors are quadrantid. So that one cutting uh, diagonally is a uh, probable uh, sporadic. Now here's that fireball that they, one of the things I captured over this several frames following was the uh, persistent train. So the leftover afterglow that was seen drifting into the sky. And I, I, I thought I actually saw it to the naked eye. I saw this strange sort of like curvy cloud drifting in the sky on its own. And there was no other clouds in that area at the time. So it just got me curious, but I didn't see the fireball, so I didn't recognize it for what it was. But here's a time lapse, 45 minutes, sped up into nine seconds. And there it is. And you can see a couple of other meteors flashing into the field of view. And I'm just gonna play this again, just so you can have a good view. And it has that sort of a yellowish orange look to it. So let's just talk a little bit about the meteor trails and uh, there, so there's the, the, about the two types. So what I captured on that fireball is what's known as a persistent train. So what it is, it may look like a puff of smoke or debris, but it's not really that actually. It's actually the air molecules in the atmosphere that are, that are um, ionized behind the meteor and that part of the uh, atmosphere, the, the, uh, the, that column of the glowing molecules is, is uh, drifted by the high altitude winds in the atmosphere. It may last for a few seconds, but sometimes up to several minutes as was the case here photographically. And it can change its uh, shape by uh, the, the high atmospheric winds. And it tends to occur in the, uh, the upper atmosphere region. And it's often more associated with fast meteors uh, simply because of the, the high energy involved there. Now you have the second type, which is the actual smoke trail, which um, is, with, is more common with the major fireballs or the bolides, like the, uh, the one you see on the left is that uh, famous uh, Russian uh, meteor that left the, uh, the huge debris. So these occur uh, generally below 80 kilometers of altitude. And this is actually non-luminous. So it's the, the trail of uh, particles, uh, debris that was stripped from the, uh, the meteor during the ablation process. And it may look like uh, a contrail behind by an aircraft. So now I will pass it over to Raymond and uh, Raymond will give us a little bit of an uh, uh, overview of his uh, captures. Thank you. Hi, uh, c'est Raymond ici, Raymond here. I hope everybody is going well. Uh, you will see is that just near, I don't know if uh, they're just down, you'll see um, uh, my meteor shower. Uh, here is one of the photos. Next, please. The, uh, the next one is in near the center bottom. I don't know if Pierre can show with his cursor on where it is. Yeah, thank you, yeah. So it's not very big, not very bright. Uh, so that's why the sky is slightly blue because I increased the sensitivity of the, of the uh, camera so that I can try and get really faint uh, meteors. Next, please. So like we were saying is that uh, uh, we are playing peekaboo and this one here, I'm trying to remember where I, Pick that one up. Oh, it's a very, very tiny one right there, as you can see. Very, very tiny. Uh, next one, please. And this one's even more difficult. It's right in the sucker hole that Pierre just circled around it. Uh, there. 
So as you can see, is that uh, we were we had a challenging evening, but an interesting one. So all of these are all quadratic. The next slide is showing what a sporadic would look like. It's at the bottom of the screen, which is uh, more colorful, was brighter itself. Maybe Pierre can highlight to show if people don't really can see it well. Yeah, right at the bottom there. So it was a good night. It was a great night. And I believe the next slide is my shot of, yes, my shot of the uh, meteor. Now, I missed the meteor because uh, I think it went between uh, shutter releases and the red, we figure it's because a train passed by and I got a bit of uh, reflection off the, uh, the train, off my lens. But as, as you can see how it's popping, and just going up, 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 and it went and goes out of my field of view and it's still going on after six minutes. So thank you and I'll bring it back to Pierre to, uh, to, uh, to continue with the slides. Bonne soirée. Thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, now, the second part of the presentation is a quick overview of the uh, meteor showers, the main ones for 2020, and a few interesting uh, facts about those. Uh, a little earlier tonight, Dave uh, gave us a bit of a, a, an overview of the um, Edo Aquarius that are peaking in just a few nights from now. And they're actually active as it is now. It's, uh, go, it's active uh, well into uh, the month of May. It's one of uh, two showers that are associated with uh, Halley, the other one being the uh, October, October Orionids, I'm sorry. From the Ottawa area, because this is primarily a southern hemisphere shower, it's only visible for a short time from about three o'clock in the morning until dawn. So for a very short, like about an hour and a half is when you can actually see those meteors. So you will never see a lot. Um, the ones you, you can see can actually be nice long earth grazers, rapid earth grazers. And some of my, the finest earth grazers that I've seen were the Edo Aquarians. So I will still make an effort to go out whenever I can to see them, but it is primarily a late night uh, thing. And this year, not great observing conditions. There's gonna be a waxing uh, gibbous moon low in the Western sky. So the earlier the, in the, the period, like the closer we are to uh, May 4th, May 5th, the, the better, the moon will be just about setting. And uh, after that, it's gonna get worse uh, every night going forward. Now the late summer period, late July has uh, for the longest time been my favorite period to uh, watch meteor showers, uh, just because there's a lot happening and uh, nothing really super active, but it's um, definitely an increase in meteor rates compared to what it's been for the previous uh, two or three months. And uh, this is dominated by the South Delta Aquarius. So all through that last week of July, from the 26th of July to the first few days of August, uh, this shower is just about active um, on a continuous basis. It's a long duration shower and it's uh, best seen in the hours after midnight. And it's also supplemented by a number of minor activity like the Capricornids, the North Delta Aquarius, uh, early Perseids and other uh, minor showers and sporadics. So it's a uh, time of the year where you can actually see uh, meteors. If you're observing with your telescope, you, uh, good chance that you're going to see something off the corner of your eye, especially if you're up after midnight. And the uh, conditions this year is going to be uh, very good. So it's a first quarter moon, which is actually good because it's going to be setting at midnight. So the, uh, the best hours for viewing are going to be nice and dark. And then everyone's favorite uh, meteor shower, the Perseids. This year, they will suffer from the presence of a rising last quarter moon. However, it won't be nearly as bad as last year. So the, the, the moon will be lower and um, it's possible to see good numbers of meteors, the Perseids, because they, tend, they do tend to be bright. Now this year, there's a chance that the Earth will cross um, a denser filament of dust at about six in the morning on the, uh, the 12th. So obviously the sun will be up uh, here, uh, but this, what this means is that in the late hours of the night on the, uh, the 12th or the morning of the 12th before towards dawn, 
uh, you might want to keep an eye and see if there is uh, an increase in the uh, activity or like an, uh, a surge in the rates. But they do tend to, one thing that, that I noticed, and it's been mentioned in the literature and I, I've seen it, uh, definitely seen it uh, visually, is that in the nights preceding the, uh, the peak produce a good numbers of uh, bright meteors, especially about a week before the peak. Um, I'm not too sure the reason why this happens, but the, um, uh, this happens about a week before the peak when the, uh, the, the rates are rising slowly. And then about a two, or two nights or so before the peak, they get faint again. And then at the maximum, things get a lot more active and then we get more bright meteors. And then they tend to get a little bit fainter after the peak. So there's a variability in the brightness, which um, no one really knows why, but there must be different clumps of matter in space. Well, here's a cool fact about the Perseids, that in the year 2028, we, uh, a strong outburst is predicted. It's predicted by um, just about all of the uh, meteor researchers uh, that were looking at it. So there's a, a strong uh, reliability, uh, especially for the uh, year 1479 dust trail that was released by the comet. That trail will be passing uh, very close to us which uh, should uh, give a rise of about um, 250 or 300 meteors per hour in the early uh, morning hours, uh, which are uh, ideal for Eastern North America. Uh, now, a quick note about the ZHR, the Zenit Hourly Rate. Uh, this simply refers to the theoretical number of meteors that a single person would see in a very dark sky, about mag 6.5 if the radiant or the area where the meteors are coming from would be directly overhead and with a wide open sky. Now this rarely happens. So the, um, uh, the reality is that most of us, even with the, uh, the best conditions possible, will always see fewer meteors than what the ZHR mentions, which is a theoretical best case scenario. Now going into October, now the uh, draconids, which are, were responsible for a nice outburst in 2018, there's one of my pictures of that, uh, that, that meter and it was one of my road trips I did to catch it because it was a very strong possibility of a strong outburst which um, actually turned out to uh, exceed the predictions. It was uh, predicted to be only about 20 to 50 per hour, but the, uh, the outburst was, was over well over 100 per hour. So this year we may get another uh, draconid activity which happens very infrequently. Um, we, could literally count in one hand the displays of draconids we would see in a lifetime. It's very rare. Uh, but this year there might be something uh, which would be responsible by the dust trails released by Jacobi designer in 1704 and 1711. Two dust trails that will be approaching the earth on the evening of the 7th, uh, one of which will be at 925 and the other one at 9 just before 10 o'clock. Now, the only thing is that the rate or what we're going to see is completely unknown at this time. I don't have any information as far as, you know, is it going to be three per hour? Is it going to be 50 or more? We do not know. I, I hope we're going to get some more information in the months coming up. Cool fact, this shower was responsible for producing the famous Jacobinids of 1933 and 46. That was when we had those big meteor storms of thousands of meteors per hour visible in uh, both Europe and North America. Now, the second uh, big shower of October is the uh, Orionids, also from Comet Halley. So this tends to be a more moderate shower in terms of the, the principal, uh, the year's uh, principal meteors. It's a uh, rate of about 20, 25 per hour. However, it's suspected to have a roughly 12 year period where elevated rates will occur. Some higher activity uh, can possibly happen in 2020 or 2022. So we're just about possibly entering this, uh, this new 12 year cycle. And this year will be first quarter moon. So it will set early at around midnight again and the radiant rises at midnight and it's uh, best visibility uh, towards uh, morning near dawn. So there's a cool fact. The, uh, the 2006 and 7 Orionids 
increased dramatically, and they surprised uh, everyone by, with the rates and also the um, numbers of fireballs. There's uh, two of my uh, photos uh, on the right side. The, uh, the one that you see on the left, the, the fireball, that was about a minus eight magnitude. So about as bright as a, uh, as a thick crescent moon. And it really surprised me when I, I saw it. And the, uh, all this um, intense activity was caused by uh, a mean motion resonance. So there was a part of the, the trail that had uh, meteoroids stuck in a resonance with Jupiter gravitationally bound together, keeping the meteoroids uh, in a tight filament. So when will that filament join in uh, or um, approach the Earth again? We do not know. But all we know is that possibly this year, we might get a bit of an elevated uh, rate activity. Uh, November, the Leonids, the famous Leonids, which also produce some historical meteor storms. Most year, nothing to get really excited about. It's a minor, minor shower, 10 to 20 per hour at the most. They are very fast meteors with uh, some uh, good fireballs. This year, uh, Mikia Sato's calculations uh, shows that there could be a possible uptick in activity where the, uh, the rate just before two o'clock in the morning and just again, just after three o'clock, there might be a small increase in activity, probably nothing big, but it's something to keep an eye on. And this year, the conditions will be excellent with new moon. And a, and a cool fact is um, the Leonids produced several major meteor storms uh, over a, a number of years. And the next time they're going to be, that stormy will, is predicted to be in the year 2094. So sadly, we have a bit of a wait before we get to see the, uh, the the uh, Leonids, that's spectacular. And then we're going into to December, which is uh, my favorite, all-time favorite meteor showers, the, the Geminids. They are by far the most reliable and prolific of all the annual showers. And the rates have been gradually increasing every year. And uh, the, the latest is that the ZHR is, uh, uh, every year is maintained at about 140 at 150. And this year is going to be excellent with new moon. So we really have a good year for the, uh, the Geminids. Uh, the broad peak, it's not a sharp peak, unlike the Quadrantids. It's uh, something that can be seen all night, and it can be seen uh, for much of the entire world, no matter where you are. So where, if you are in the uh, correct area the, to see the, the, the peak time, you'll probably get the 140 to 150. Anywhere else, still going to get a very respectable um, 90 plus rate, which uh, would be well worth braving the, uh, the cold nights. Well, the cool fact is that the Geminids do produce nice, bright, medium speed meteors. And it's one of the few showers that uh, can also be enjoyed nearly all night. The radiant rises at around dinner time, and by uh, 9 or 10 o'clock, the rates are active, and then it culminates at, uh, it's at its best uh, just after midnight or about one o'clock in the morning. And finally, the Ursids. Just wanted to give a little bit of a heads up on this uh, little known shower. Uh, the uh, Ursids um, uh, um, have um, in the past produced a number of, um, of outbursts that uh, reached about, uh, a few of them reached 100 per hour. And this year may be one of those special years where we could get a significant outburst. And here's where it gets exciting. According to, the, uh, to Peter Yeniskens, whose uh, model shows that the Earth will approach the uh, trail left by the comet in the year 815. So it's a very, very old trail. But apparently, it's a rich, richly uh, condensed uh, trail that could give rise to a rate of 420 per hour at about 10 o'clock. So imagine that. Then it's not over. At uh, just after midnight, there is a uh, mean motion resonance. So there is an area of space where the meteoroids were held together by the uh, the gravity of most likely one of the the large outer planets, and this could give a, a rise of the rates. And finally, the year 829 trail, just after one o'clock in the morning, with a rate approaching 500 per hour which is unbelievable. So this is something to keep an eye on. There's not a whole lot of information that I've found 
Uh, this is about as much as I know about it. But I'm sure in the coming months, uh, we'll, we'll uh, most likely hear more. And of course, there could be other minor activity uh, in Cree. So the entire night could be actually quite interesting. It will be first quarter moon, so the evening hours will suffer from some moonlight interference. After one o'clock in the morning, it'll be a nice dark sky. So on this note, I see there's a few questions uh, coming in. I'll take a look at that, or uh, uh, Dave, if you I'll want just to. I'll read them out to you up there. Yeah, for sure, okay. for sure. So from Gary, what ISO at f-stop do you typically use? Most likely, I will uh, use a minimum of ISO 1600. Depending on how dark the sky is, 1600, preferably even 3200 if I have a very dark sky. I want to try to get the maximum sensitivity to capture the fainter meteors. And the f-stop, generally I'm about f2.0. My lens can open as much as 1.4. I try to avoid it only because the sky will get washed out very quickly with all that light and sensitivity. And also, I want to reduce the effect of the uh, vignetting, which is the uh, lens or the, uh, the lens effect darkening the picture on the edges. So if I close it down a little bit, then I get a better result. And okay. next question. Yeah. So from Jenna, what was your favorite meteor shower that you have experienced and what made it memorable for you? Uh, by far, uh, that's a hard question because a lot of them are so memorable for different uh, ways. But I, I, easily, I would say it was the 2001 Leonids. It was a meteor storm that I uh, witnessed in the, uh, on, the, on the hilltop of um, the Spruce Knob, West Virginia, on their seventh mag skies with perfect sky conditions. And it was uh, by far my most amazing meteor shower sky phenomena when there's so many meteors falling uh, that I can barely count them. And there's fireballs and there's early earth grazers. It was the um, basically the event of a lifetime, but 2001 Leonids, and um, those who, of you who remember it will never ever forget it, I'm sure. And a second question from her. Uh, do you have a specific meteor that stands out in your memory? The specific meteor, I would say, was the very first fireball that I ever seen when I was about eight years old. I was just in my yard, just uh, watching for satellites going by, trying to look at the, the stars, and then suddenly it happened. It was a bright meteor with a long train following behind, and that probably kicked up my interest in uh, my, my passion into meteors for, for a lifetime. Okay. Um, from Rick, he says, I'm interested in observing techniques, what to record and how to record. Is there some website or something maybe you could direct them towards? Absolutely. There's um, a, a few good websites that will give you some information. Uh, check out the American Meteor Society. They have a law, they have a, um, a guide, introductory guide that will um, give you the pointers of what's needed to get into meteors. Also look at the International Meteor Organization website. They also have an extensive guide that will show you, you know, where to get the limiting magnitude charts and uh, what data to record and where to submit and the pointers. So that would be the two sites I would recommend. Okay, thank you. And from John, have you ever had any issues with wildlife during your observing nights apart from your partner? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> wildlife, I've been, I, I love getting out in the remote areas in places where there's a, I know there's a lot of wildlife. The um, only encounter, the one encounter that probably got, had me the mo more nervous is, uh, was many years ago, I was at a site near Castleman in the middle of winter, I was out on my own in the uh, quarry, and then I felt a presence on my right side. I quick, I just looked around me, and I saw those two coyotes about 20 foot away, just starting to circle me. They were probably just sniffing me out, being curious, wondering what was there. As soon as I bolted in my chair, because I was a bit startled, they took off, and they were gone. So I think the, the thing is, the, the um, bears, the animals, um, if they know there's a human presence, they're more than likely very skittish about us being there. Okay, and final questions from Margaret. She said, um, I've seen two fireballs in Arizona. Uh, for one, I turned around a second before and then it began and ended. Um, do you ever hear any sounds uh, when you, from the meteor showers, like large fireballs? Uh, sounds, it's possible. If there's a large fireball that uh, penetrated deep enough in the atmosphere, especially the ones that are uh, more rocky material, asteroid uh, origin, that could potentially drop a meteorite to the surface, uh, they can sometimes be accompanied by a sonic boom. 
uh, into the deeper layers of the atmosphere. So you will not hear the sound simultaneously with the meteor, but if you listen closely in the minutes that follow, you might hear the distant uh, rumble, like a rumble of uh, thunder, and that's the sonic boom that you're hearing from the, that uh, meteor that's more than likely you know, dropping something to the surface of the Earth. Uh, there's also the other type of sound that's a bit controversial. Uh, there's uh, what's called electrophonic uh, sound, which is uh, basically the uh, low, uh, the uh, ultra low uh, frequency sound trend, or or, um, or the, uh, the basically it's transmitted through wires in the immediate vicinity of the observer, and that uh, radio frequency is, is uh, converted back into sound. So in simple terms, uh, the uh, some observers have claimed that they heard the sound at the same time as the meteor, which would be explained by a radio frequency being transmitted into sound by so an object. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a matter of uh, research on that topic. Okay. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. OK, we're going to now move on to our observing reports. So uh, Jim Thompson, let me just bring you up here. Okay, you're gonna make you the focus. There we go, you're ready to go. All right, great. Uh, so the first series of images were from an observing session I had from my backyard about three weeks ago. Um, it being springtime, I was concentrating mostly on galaxies, um, as you can see here, but I also did catch a couple of uh, globular clusters. Um, so this is just sort of a, a selection of what I captured. I think the next two images are also similar. If you could go to the next one, please, Chris. Thank you. Um, I did catch one planetary nebula, so M97, the Owl Nebula in the upper left. Now these images are all black and white. Uh, the reason for that is I was using a monochrome camera in conjunction with an infrared pass filter. So all these images are infrared light only. The reason I did that was to try to cut out as much of the light pollution from my backyard as possible. Now the, uh, the object in the uh, center lower position is actually the uh, ch challenge object for uh, this month. It's, uh, well actually the galaxy is 2903, but the brighter, the brighter blob on the uh, spiral arm to the uh, left of the center of the galaxy is given its own NGC number, it's NGC 2905. It's a star forming region in that galaxy. And that was the, uh, I think the medium difficulty challenge object for the month. Uh, next one, please, Chris. Uh, this is my last picture of galaxies and these are all uh, unusual galaxies. Galaxies that are in the process of interacting with each other uh, that's why they don't have very regular shapes. Uh, eventually, uh, scientists believe that these galaxies will uh, merge with each other at some point. The, uh, the bottom right is one of my favorites. It's called the Whale and the Pup Galaxy. I, I guess because they bear a resemblance to uh, maybe a humpback whale. And it's actually a spiral galaxy that we're seeing edge on. So we're seeing the dust lanes of that galaxy edge on in that, from our perspective in that shot. And my last picture is the uh, lunar challenge for this month. And it's the crater Piccolomini, which I will try to annotate here. So this is the crater down here in the center bottom part of the screen. That's Piccolomini. And it sort of uh, truncates the Altai Scarp, which is this curly uh, 
escarpment here, which is uh, part of a much larger uh, impact basin. It's an interesting part of the moon to, to observe. This was taken about a month ago, almost exactly. So it was around quarter, first quarter moon, maybe a day after first quarter. Uh, there's a lot of interesting features like this string of craters up here, which is kind of curious how they're almost uh, in a perfect line. I'm not sure if scientists have come into an agreement on what causes that, <laughs> if it's multiple impacts or if it's a, uh, a volcanic feature. Anyways, that's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. Not quite yet for me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, you may have seen some emails sent out about a week ago about Astronomy Day this year. Uh, although we will not be having uh, in-person festivities, uh, either at the museum or at uh, Chapters on Silver City. Uh, the OAOG and RASC Ottawa Centre have joined forces to put on a virtual event to which everyone is invited. Uh, the idea will be for members of our uh, respective groups to share either a live view from their telescope out of their backyard with everybody over the Zoom webinar uh, platform, or if it's cloudy, to share uh, some sort of astronomy-related presentation. And that will go from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. So if you are interested in joining us, you can check out the website that was posted there. Uh, here is uh, a look at the schedule as we have laid it out currently. So we'll start with some solar viewing in the morning uh, and transition to the moon and deep sky observing through the day. And we have a number of presentations there that will happen uh, whether it's clear or cloudy. Both some introductory uh, lessons on telescopes and observing, as well as some more advanced uh, presentations. So currently the forecast looks good for the morning, but not so good for the evening. So I guess we'll just, uh, Play it by ear <laughs> as the time comes. Um, if you want to participate in the event through the webinar interface, you will need to register in advance. And there is a link to do that on either the Astro Day Ottawa website or on the RASC Ottawa Facebook page. If you don't want to connect using the webinar, then there will also be a YouTube live stream link uh, posted in the morning that you can use as well. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Jim, oops. <laughs> okay, hear me well? Yep. Okay, very good. So we're now looking at the uh, Markarians chain, which is a stretch of galaxies that forms part of the, Vir the Virgo cluster. When viewed from Earth, the galaxies lie along a smooth curved line, as you can see. Charles Messier first discovered two of the galaxies, M84 and M86 in 1781, and those would be the two bright elliptical galaxies on the right. I read that the Markarian's chain was named after Benjamin Markarian, an Armenian astrophysicist, who was the first to discover that the galaxies share a common motion through space. At least seven Markarian galaxies appear to move coherently, while others are merely superimposed in the same line of sight. This image was taken off my balcony last month using the William Optics 80 millimeter refractor, the Mellencamp Sky Raider 10C, and this is a stack of eight 15 second exposures using an ultra high contrast filter. Uh, next slide, please. This is the LEO trio, which is a small group of galaxies about 35 million light years away in the constellation LEO. This galaxy group consists of the spiral galaxies M M65, M66, and NGC 3628. 
This is a stack of eight 14 second exposures using the same equipment and filter. Next slide, please. This is a cropped image of M94 using my eight inch Smith Cassegrain. It's a spiral galaxy in the constellation Cain's Venatici. This is a stack of 30 18 second exposures. And I'm very pleased that I was able to get this kind of detail with average stacking for this length of time with my alt as mount. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. We'll turn it over to uh, Paul now. Hi there. Uh, am I coming through okay? Yes, you're coming through clear. Yep. Super. Well, hello, everybody. I, I trust you're all doing well out there in uh, virtual meeting land. So in the last two meetings, I was pretty excited about the prospects of seeing a bright comet uh, for us all in, uh, in May, namely Comet Atlas. This uh, comet was only discovered on December the 28th when it was down around magnitude 17. However, it began to brighten rapidly in the new year, and by late February, when I took this image, it had already reached magnitude 12 and seemed to be on a tear to get substantially brighter. Next one, please. So by March 25th, it was up to about magnitude eight and astronomers were really getting their hopes up for a visual treat. Uh, note, note on this image, the, uh, the size and the shape of the extended spherical halo uh, and also the very bright compact central area of the coma. But shortly after uh, I took this image, uh, things began to change. Next image, please. The steady increase in brightness uh, seemed to stall and uh, the comet's growing light curve started to flatten, as you can see here. By early April, there was some speculation of a possible fragmentation of the nucleus that might account for this. The yellow bars here uh, indicate the nights I was able to do some imaging of the comet, and it appears as though the, uh, the image I just showed you was taken very close to its maximum brightness. The next image on April the 12th was noticeably on the downside of the curve. Next one, please, Chris. Not only had the comet dimmed, but observers also noticed a general change in its appearance, with the spherical halo starting to diminish and the central area of the coma becoming extended and more diffuse. The tail also seemed to become relatively more prominent. I took this image uh, with a 600 millimeter telephoto lens and Canon 70D DSLR and I could see that there was certainly some structural changes there, but really needed to get a closer look. Next one, please. So five days later on uh, April the 17th, I was able to image the comet with my 11 inch uh, telescope and a CCD camera, and I was stunned by what I observed. The extended spherical coma had morphed into a more elongated teardrop form, and there was definitely some uh, structure in the tail. Zooming in on this view re revealed what was going on. Next one, please. I could see that the central area of the coma had indeed broken into at least two major fragments and there were some irregular structural forms in the, in the tail. Next one, please. On closer examination, there also appeared to be two uh, much smaller fragments, C and D, trailing closely behind the major ones, A and B. The brighter knots of material further back in the tail appear irregular in form and more extended and diffuse than the fragments. These have also been observed by others and it's speculated that th these might actually be clouds of debris released by the fragmentation of the nucleus. Uh, next one, please. So three days after I took this image, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope was targeted at the comet for a closer look uh, and, and image the area indicated by the yellow rectangle. Next one, please. Not only did uh, Hubble see that there were four major fragments, but it also revealed that these two were being torn apart into many lesser sized bodies. Comet Atlas was literally crumbling. Next one, please. So alas, there will be no bright Comet Atlas later this month as originally hoped for, and Comet Atlas has become Comet Alas. But wait, there is another. In a rather neat coincidence, another comet that was just discovered in late March has undergone a rapid uh, increase in brightness just in the last week, 
and is already at naked eye visibility from a dark sky site. This is Comet Swan that Dave mentioned earlier. It has quite a long tail already, and at least uh, photographically at this point, some observers are reporting it possibly up to eight degrees in length. That's like 16 times the diameter of the, the, uh, of the moon. It'll make its closest approach to Earth in just 12 days, and its closest approach to the sun uh, on May 27th. Some models currently predict it may reach uh, magnitude three or even brighter in the next couple of weeks, providing it doesn't pull an atlas on us. Uh, there are a few gotchas with this comet though, and so it'll be actually, uh, it's actually a bit of a, an observing challenge I have for you all here. This comet's orbit definitely favors those at much more southerly latitudes where it's currently starting to put on a good show, as you can see in this gorgeous image taken only four days ago from Namibia. Orbital mechanics dictate that this object is currently not visible in our night sky and will not rise high in our sky at all during its swing around the sun. But we do have a window of time to see it, and uh, I just got a hold of this data, and so I've prepared uh, a few charts for you. Next one, please. The major problem we have with this object is that its orbit won't carry it high into our sky, and also our nights are starting to get much shorter as we approach the summer solstice. And of course, there's the moon, which will be bright enough to diminish the comet's brightness whenever it's up at the same time. So these charts show that we do have a window of opportunity to see, uh, to see it when it may be at its brightest, actually, and as it approaches the sun later this month. They cover the period from May 16th to May 31st. Prior to May 16th, and that's only two weeks from now, uh, the comet does not come above our horizon in the evening hours. And after May 31st, the moon will be clobbering it for at least a week. After that point in time, it'll just be hugging the horizon before the end of twilight. So in two weeks from now, on May 16th, the comet will be just over one degree above the horizon in the northeast at the beginning of dawn. That's obviously a challenge and you'll wanna be under a dark sky with a clear flat vista to the northeast to see it. The sky should remain dark enough for at least 15 to 20 minutes or so to see this, which allows the comet to climb a few degrees higher above the horizon. The red circle, by the way, indicates the field of view you'll have in uh, seven by 50 binoculars, which should give you a good view hopefully in addition to a nice naked eye view. So the next few charts I'll show you are just a, 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 few, a few days during that uh, two week interval from the, uh, from the 16th to the 31st. And uh, you can see the data that I've included here uh, on uh, particularly May 16th, as I say, this is the first, first night when we actually get a chance to see this thing uh, above the horizon uh, at the beginning of dawn, which is at 3.22 in the morning. The elevation will only be about 1.3 degrees, and its azimuth will be 45 degrees, so putting it pretty, pretty much squarely in the, in the northeast part of the sky. Next image, please. So five days later, um, and again, this, this, this interval I've, uh, I've shown, I'm showing you here is with no moon interfering at all. So May 21st, um, the beginning of dawn is about 10 minutes earlier, starting at about 312, but the comet's elevation is at almost five degrees at this point in time, and you can see it's uh, slowly drifting uh, towards the uh, towards the uh, left uh, as it moves in, the, in its orbit. Its azimuth here will be like 29 degrees. Next one, please. May 25th, four days later, again, uh, beginning of dawn is again about 10 minutes earlier at 3.05. Comet's elevation, and this is about as good as it gets elevation-wise for us, is only going to be about five degrees. That's that's pretty low in the sky, but certainly beats one degree. Uh, it's still about uh, ten diameters of the full moon up in the sky, and uh, and if we get a clear clear uh, sky, hopefully we'll be able to get a good visual on this. And and uh, as I say, if 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 the predictions hold, it'll uh, it'll um, it'll be a naked eye object, and uh, and. Uh, Binoculars will probably give you your best view though. All right, there are three other slides that I have for you here. For those that find uh, three in the morning a little hard for various reasons, uh, there is a very short sub window during this interval when the comet will actually be visible uh, in, uh, during the earlier part of the evening. Oh yeah, sorry, I, I, I forgot about this one. This is May 31st, so this is the closing of the window of this, this dawn window that I've been talking about. And again, beginning of dawn occurring at 2.55 in the morning with the comet's elevation at 3.2 degrees. 
All right, so for the sub window, there's a, there's, there's a span of four days from May 21st to May the 25th when it's actually visible uh, after the sun sets, so after the end of twilight. So the next one there, please, Chris. So again, this is May 21st. Uh, the end of twilight occurs at uh, 10 minutes to 11 in the evening. At this point in time, the comet will be just uh, just to the west of north um, at uh, an azimuth of 341 degrees, and it'll be about two degrees above the horizon, almost two degrees above the horizon. That's on May 21st. Uh, two days later, next one there, please, Chris. You will see it's uh, it's gone up to about 4.2 degrees. Uh, of elevation at the end of twilight, and again, I remind you that this this the end of twilight um, you can see it before then as well, but it'll be lower to the horizon, obviously, um, and you're looking through a lot of mucky air there so uh, this is this is about our, our our best shot and the last one I have for you so the last one of this sub interval again is may the twenty fifth uh, comet elevation will be about five point nine degrees and azimuth at uh, 338. So that's our opportunity. I, ho I hope you get a chance to see this thing. Uh, I'm certainly going to be looking for it um, uh, because uh, uh, especially after uh, after uh, the performance or lack of it uh, then uh, from Comet Atlas. So we'll cross our fingers for some clear skies during the last two weeks of this month and see if uh, Comet Swan puts on the show that uh, Atlas couldn't. Be safe everybody. Take care. Hey, thank you very much. So I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Yeah, I'll unmute myself. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, this is uh, M95, is one of the challenge objects, and uh, it's a four hour exposure. And if you look at it closely, it looks like a flower, which would normally indicate that it's been over smoothed uh, when I processed it. But, and I did smooth it a bit, but it looked like this before I smoothed it. So I, I, I don't know exactly what I'm looking at through fog or, or a little dust in, the, in M95 at, at all myself. It's in Leo, so it was fairly easy to image uh, this time of year. And it's about 33 million light years away. Okay, next uh, slide. Um, this is uh, another challenge object, uh, N, uh, NGC uh, 2905, and I, I took this image, I t it, this was a, um, a black and white image, and uh, I was looked at it and I, I said, I had, I've seen this before, and so I looked back in my own files and I found that I'd imaged it in the past. And it's actually, the, the galaxy is NGC 2903, and uh, the, uh, the, the 2905 is just a little tiny part of it. I think somebody pointed that out already out to us. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, so it's it's that little bright spot there is actually the uh, challenge object, and uh, it's uh, I'm not sure how you'd see it easily. Uh, by the way, what I did was uh, I had a black and white image, and I took some of my data from the past with uh, which which was color and colorized the image a little bit. Okay, uh, next one please is also a challenge object. This is uh, uh, Abel uh, 1060. And it's a galaxy cluster, obviously. It's low down in the soup of the southern horizon. So it was a, not a real easy thing to image. And um, it's, everything in here is just about is a galaxy uh, eventually. Okay, next slide, please. And it's a lot easier to see what you're looking at if you actually look at these things as a negative. And um, so if it's a gray smudge, it's a galaxy for sure. If it's got uh, diffraction spikes, it's not. It's uh, it's a star. Okay, so next image, please. And I th th there's some stars, obvious stars here, and the brightest star in this picture is magnitude uh, 4.8, which is the only one you'd see. The 6.6, .6, I don't think many people would see that. Uh, magnitude 10, uh, obviously, you're not going to see. So this is a very very dim part of the sky. It's also low on the horizon. I don't think you'd easily spot much in it. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, these are there's a whole bunch of galaxies in here, and some of these are uh, pretty well known. Uh, uh, I, I see I've seen images of some of these before, but there's uh, just a slew of galaxies.
And again, this is one of the challenge objects. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is an, uh, just this is a, uh, the pinwheel, and it's about 21 million light years away, and it's one of Messier's very last ones that he spotted, 101. I know it'd be close to 110, but this was one of the last ones he put on his list. Uh, and it's a to me, it's just an absolute gorgeous uh, 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 image, and it was easy to uh, see. Uh, I, I've seen this with a telescope too. And uh, at this time of the year, I, uh, next slide please, I just point my telescopes up to uh, Hercules. It's high in the sky. It's a fantastic uh, um, thing to, to see. I, I just absolutely love it to see it. And um, I did it a little differently this time. Uh, this is a long exposure. It's about four hours, uh, six hours in length. And each of the sub exposures is, is red, green, or blue, and it's it's uh, a ten minute ten minutes. Uh, normally, the, the stars would be blown out if you took a ten minute exposure of this fairly bright object. Uh, but this is uh, when you do it by colors, you're only getting one third the light, and so it's uh, it turned out to be pretty good. And uh, it's it's a pretty deep image too. If if you look, you can see a few galaxies in there. Uh, it's about 22,000 light years away. It's really old. It's about 12 billion years old. And it's, it's magnitude 5.8, which is sort of theoretically you're able to see it uh, naked eye. You have to be younger than me to do that, but it's really easy to see in binoculars at, or any telescope. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Hi. Um, there, you're on Terrace. Thanks. Uh, Paul Cloninger just gave a wonderful review of this comet and uh, its lifespan. It's the same Atlas comet, which uh, was, well, failed our hopes a little bit, but uh, it was still beautiful to see it in the sky, in the sky while it lasted as, as a whole object. And uh, just to add what uh, Paul said, I just Googled that Hubble Space Telescope identified about 30 fragments of this comet on April 20th and 25 pieces on April 23rd. So low chance that we will see that as, as a one bright solid core in the future. But uh, also to add uh, what Paul said that around May 22nd, the remnants of this comet will be pretty close to that new uh, Swan comet. There is a chance maybe under a longer exposure that uh, we will be able to see uh, the, the remnant of, of this comet showing up in the pictures, maybe not. But uh, if it lasted, it would have been a really great show of two bright comets uh, in about the same place showing up. But uh, unfortunately, uh, there is not that much luck with those comets these days. <laughs> Next, next slide, please. Um, yeah, the uh, Venus. So it's relevant to today's presentation, and I'm very happy to to have these pictures ready. It's a wonderful, as from my point of view, planet. It's it's a goddess of skies, the most beautiful, as they thought of a star or or wandering star, and. Um, it was on a close approach to Pleiades, so this was taken on um, March. 25th. And a uh, few days after that, if, if you think that the where Pleiades is, is the direction that the Venus was going, it would have passed through Pleiades and would continue its uh, journey across the sky. But unfortunately, uh, the, the days were clouded and uh, I was not able to see, uh, sorry, to take the picture rather when it was passing through the uh, asterism. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is a very tricky image because of compression and a really, really tiny detail on this picture. You might not be able to see what I wanted to show you, but this is actually Venus. It's right in the middle of this picture. And the interesting story behind it, so let's go to the next slide. Yeah, here it is. So the interesting story that I wanted to image it during the daytime, and it's quite possible with a telescope, but uh, what's interesting is that uh, I couldn't polar align my telescope. I couldn't find it in the sky. Um, 
and I roughly uh, uh, oriented my telescope in a direction where the planet should be. And you wouldn't believe me, I saw it uh, on um, uh, May 25th, this was taken, with my eyes during the bright sun, the, during the, the day with the bright sunlight, and the magnitude was minus 4.73. So um, it showed up even on the picture, this picture later on when I took it around like five o'clock, I started imaging it at three. It took about two hours to take some shots and uh, it was still bright enough at around 5 p.m. to take this picture. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and this is an overview of um, what the size and appearance was like since February 19th until um, just a few days ago, uh, April. April 25th. So on February 19th, I took this picture from Florida during Winter Star Party where the, the plant was still relatively small. So this angular size on the left is about 17 arc seconds, while the largest, the far right, is uh, 36 arc seconds. You can see how not only size changes, but uh, the phase changes as well, which is um, obvious when the when you think how the planet goes around the sun and uh, goes around the sun, uh, sun and now it's pr pretty close to us, but in a few um, days, it's gonna be so narrow of a crescent that actually it will disappear from our views to reappear later on on the other side that we'll be able to see it only in early morning. I used the uh, ultraviolet filter to image some clouds in it. They show up on some pictures quite, quite nicely, maybe not as detailed as an uncompressed image would show, but let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, I guess because of compression, it doesn't show much of the fine structure in these clouds. Uh, and um, uh, it looked a little bit kind of irregular. It had a strange pattern in it. So I tried to verify this image. There is a, a photographer from Poland uh, who does this, uh, type of imaging as well for Venus. So uh, I, I compared my image with his, which was taken a bit later, three days ago. And let's go to the next slide. And it appeared to be actually true. So this, uh, I, I would expect the longer filaments to be of this, you know, like a cloud type formations while they were rather spotty. And those same spots, although in a different location, showed up on his picture as well. Um, I guess that's all. Is there one more slide from me? No, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Taras. Okay, folks. So uh, we've got the uh, observing challenges from last month, and and uh, some of you with your observations showed us that we you were able to find them. So we had M ninety five, MG MGC uh, twenty nine oh five. Uh, Able 1060 and Crater Piccolomini. Next slide. So here are our challenges for this month. Our beginner challenge is Messier 51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Next one. The intermediate challenge is Able 36. Next one. Advanced challenge is UGC 5470. All these will be in astronauts, so you folks can uh, re reference them there. Next slide. The lunar challenge is Crater Archimedes and Montes Archimedes. That was in our M&M challenge this week as well. Okay, next one. So there's a summary of the uh, challenges for this month. I encourage you to get out there when we have uh, clear skies. Next one. Well, I guess we won't be able to go to the library. The museum's closed right now, so I'll continue on. Fred Lawson Observatory. This is uh, for members only. It is currently closed and uh, due to COVID-19, we'll let you know when we can uh, reopen it. So we ask people not to visit the site at this time. Here are the people that are involved in the club to uh, help you out. So thank you. We had Triple uh, X uh, in the audience. I think, Chris, we had about 125, 126. I counted at one point, uh, 127 people. <laughs> 127. Okay. So that's great. But people were coming and going. So the actual total number who watched, I'll only know when I look at stats afterwards, but it'll exceed 127. 
That's super. So thank you for everybody who helped out uh, uh, tonight. Thank you to the RESC National Office uh, allowing us to use their, uh, their uh, Zoom account for this. Unfortunately, no post-meeting entertainment. Uh, we normally do this uh, after a meeting, but uh, at some point things will reopen and we'll be able to enjoy that again. Okay, so uh, if you're uh, not a member of the Royal Astronomical Society, we have three types of memberships, a regular membership at $88, a family membership, which starts at uh, base price is $82.50, $15 an adult and eight ten a youth, and youth membership uh, for $53. Next slide, or I think there's something going across the slide. So uh, we do have uh, the local chapter, uh, the center here, uh, will uh, help those out because we know economic times right now are pretty tight. And if you're having difficulty trying to renew your membership or you'd like to get a membership and can't afford it, uh, please email president at ottawa.resc.ca and we will try to help you out. Okay, so some of the memberships uh, benefits of being a member of the Royal Astronomical Society. We have the Ted Bone Ted Bean Loan Library, so that's a mouthful. Uh, once we get back into the museum, we'll have the uh, Stan Mott Library. Once COVID-19 is over, we have the Fred Lawson Observatory, which is out near Almont. Next slide. You will also get Sky News, which comes out every two months. You have the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Observer's Handbook, which is uh, super, and we have our local uh, astronauts um, put together by Gordon Webster, and uh, that comes out monthly. Excellent uh, publication and an electronic one for you. So our next meeting is Friday, June the 5th, 7.30 p.m. It'll be another Zoom webinar, and uh, thank you folks for coming out tonight, and we look forward to seeing all of you uh, in, in a month, but also please join us for the uh, Astronomy Day tomorrow as well. Thank you.